Hi there, I'm Ari with the Tech Vibes Guru, and this is the third episode of my 2019 PC Assembly Guide. If you've seen the previous two episodes, you know that in the first episode, we took this Thermaltake 8500 case, we stripped it down, removed all the unnecessary components, and then installed a custom set of fans from Thermaltake as well as Noctua, as well as the Silverstone ST1000 PTS 1000 watt power supply. In the second episode, we installed everything in the motherboard that included the 9900K CPU from Intel, a 32 gigabytes of Corsair RAM, and a Samsung 970 Pro 1 terabyte M.2 PCIe drive. I also showed how you would connect a 2.5 inch SATA drive. Uh, we used a crucial drive in that, in that example. And then we installed the motherboard in the case. In today's episode, we're going to be doing just two discrete things. We're going to be installing this liquid cooler and we're going to be installing the video card. Uh, of those two tasks, the liquid cooler is definitely the more time consuming of, of them. The video card will take about mm, maybe a minute to install, so we'll do that at the end of the video. So the bulk of the video is going to be looking at this Thermaltake Water 3.0 360 ARGB Sync liquid cooler. This is the latest and perhaps greatest liquid cooler from Thermaltake just released this month. The claim to fame of this liquid cooler is that it has Thermaltake's most advanced RGB system. In fact, it's an addressable RGB system that will sync with your motherboard, hence the name. It'll actually work with any major motherboard manufacturer. That includes ASRock, ASUS, Gigabyte, and MSI. They've all settled on a standard uh, pin arrangement for an ARGB controller. I'm very excited about that because I think standardization in the RGB industry is a good thing for PC consumers. And this is Thermaltake's first take on that standard that we've seen in a cooler from Thermaltake. I should say that a lot of other companies aren't so eager to jump on that bandwagon and that's their right. They may think they have a better proprietary solution. Uh, my personal opinion is that we're going to all be better off if we move to a standard. Just as we have standards for fan controls, just as we have standards for the type of RAM we use, I, I like the idea of having standards for RGB lighting. Now I should mention that Thermaltake is one of the main sponsors of this video series and indeed of this video, this episode, but so is Noctua. Noctua has pr provided its brand new NTH2 thermal paste as well as its new alcohol cleaning wipes which make the removal of existing thermal paste much, much easier. To show you how this works, what we're going to do is first install the Thermaltake cooler using the pre-applied paste that you can see on the bottom of this cooler cooling block right here. Like most all-in-one coolers, it does come with thermal paste pre-applied, but not every cooler has that, and if you're using a tower air cooler, for instance, most likely you're going to have to apply it manually. So what we'll do is bolt down the cooler with the pre-applied thermal paste, then I'm going to take it off and show you how to remove thermal paste safely and easily with Noctua's cleaning wipes, and then reapply using this tube of NTH2. Once we're done with that, we will move on to the GeForce RTX 2080 Ti video card. This is from EVGA, and it's their black model. It's the reference design in terms of both length and width. It's a two-slot, two-fan, 10.6-inch long uh, cooler, and it's something that I think is pretty important in the industry because with most 2080 Ti cards now being quite a bit larger, both longer and wider, they won't fit in a lot of compact cases. Because I do benchmarking on a whole range of systems, I needed a card that could fit in any of my systems. And this, in fact, does fit in most ITX systems, which is a great thing. All right, without further ado, I'm actually going to uh, position the case down here on the table so you can get a look at the case itself and where we're going to be installing this 360 millimeter liquid cooler as, as well as its array of three 120 millimeter fans. Before we do that, though, one thing I want to mention is the top of this case actually pops right off, and I've actually done that already. I can show you. This has pop rivets, just like the front of the case. A lot of cases require screws to remove the top of the case, or in, in simpler cases, you actually just have easy access to the vents on top without any cover like this. Uh, so it depends on your case manufacturer and how they choose to attach the case top. So you'll have to look into your manual to figure out how to remove that if, if indeed there is a cover on the top of your case blocking access to your uh, liquid cooler's uh, vents on top. So I've already popped this off. I'm going to put it aside 
and we're going to go ahead and install this cooler in that case. So I'll be back to you in a second. All right, the first thing we need to do is actually bolt on the three fans onto this, onto this radiator. You have to be careful about the orientation of the fans. And as I mentioned in the first episode, every fan is actually built the same way. You have the hub and the spinning fan, which is on the intake side, and then you have the frame on the back side. That's the exhaust. So if you think about where you're placing the fan or, or the radiator in the case, uh, that will dictate how you set up your fans. Now, in my opinion, every liquid radiator should be set up as an exhaust. And a lot of marketing photos you see from the major cooler manufacturers, and in particular case manufacturers, you're going to see these radiators mounted in the front of a case with the air blowing through inside to the case. Uh, that's just bad thermal management, all right? And they do that because a lot of cases don't support mounting a radiator like this up on the roof, um, or simply because it looks better, they can show off the color, colored lighting or something because in the roof you don't see it as well. I don't care about marketing. I'm all about thermal performance, and that means mounting this to the roof of the case. That means we want to blow air through the radiator and out. To do that, we then need the hubs of the fans pointing down. That means when they're attached to the radiator, like so, they're going to blow through the radiator and out of the case, which is exactly what you want. Now, there are a lot of screws that I have to handle here, and if you look inside any liquid cooling uh, cooler product packaging, you'll find a whole assortment of pieces, of mounts, brackets for different manufacturers, and it can be a little bit confusing. Uh, but these long screws are pretty typical of what you'll find in, in a liquid cooler. These are to go through the fan frame and into the radiator. Now I have three fans, each one requiring four screws, so of course that means I have 12 screws. So I'm going to skip ahead in a moment because you don't need to see me attach all 12 of these screws. But what I'm going to do instead is just show you how the fans line up next to each other. Oh, another thing that we need to think about actually, and I've just caught myself making perhaps a slight error, is the orientation of the cables coming off of these fans. Now, if this is going to be in the roof of the case, we really want the cables coming out towards the back of the motherboard. So that means I actually want my cables not on the side here, but actually pointing over here. So that was just a little oversight, but luckily that reminded me to remind you. Uh, that you need to think about the orientation of those cables. And you may have noticed, gosh, there's a lot of cable coming out of this fan, right? I, you're probably just familiar with one cable coming out of a fan. Well, yes, it has a, this is the power cable, the PWM cable, but it also has its RGB cable. So any RGB fan on the market today uh, is going to have two cables coming out of it, which means even more cable management. So yes, I do want that at the back of the case. And the way I'm going to mount this in the case, up in the roof like this, uh, this will be back towards the back of the case. So that's where I want my, my, uh, my cables coming out. So we're going to redo that. And then I'm going to skip ahead to show you how the fans look when they're all side by side. Okay, I've affixed my three fans to the radiator. The next step is actually to prepare the uh, pump to be installed on the CPU. Now, I've actually taken the liberty of... of going ahead and uh, uh, installing this ahead of time, but I'm actually going to take it apart just to show you how easy this is. You're going to have, in most liquid coolers that are based on the Asatec patent, you're going to have a very similar design. You're going to have a bracket, and the bracket is uh, going to be designed either for Intel or AMD. It's going to slip over the back, and then you have to kind of twist it just one slight rotation and get the, the tabs into the notches and on the, on the side of here, okay? So that's in place. I should note, actually I want to orient it. So this is going to be, I of course want my thermal take branding uh, pointing up, and that means I actually have to orient the bracket so that when it's in line with the CPU socket, my thermal take branding is pointed right side up, and now we have that in place, okay? This is just a snap bracket, or snap lock I should say, and it snaps the bracket into place. I gotta make sure I snap all four sides, and it's in. If you used an AMD uh, processor, you would have a different bracket on here, but the me method of mounting is the same. 
This is actually the back plate. This is a plastic back plate. Some CPU coolers use a metal back plate. Um, Thermaltake recommends that you use these little pieces of double-sided tape. The double-sided tape, I believe, is just uh, to ensure that the back plate stays on as you're positioning it. So you don't have to have kind of one hand behind the, uh, the case while the other hand is, you know, uh, positioning your pump. Um, I don't believe that this tape is actually providing additional insulation because this plastic bracket doesn't, doesn't need it. It's not going to conduct electricity. But yeah, these two pieces of double-sided tape will just position the back plate and allow you to kind of stick it to the back of the motherboard as you work on the front of the case. And that's what we're going to do now. I'm going to bring the case over here. We're going to, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and install this in the back of the case. So you're not going to see me doing that, but that's what I'm going to do. And then you're going to see the front of the case and we're going to install this cooler. All right, I've actually determined that I really need to route this mess of spaghetti cables to the back of the case before I put this in. And another thing I want to point out about CPU uh, coolers, uh, the radiators themselves, they often interfere with your EPS connectors to your CPU. This is a very, very common problem. I have a lot of readers and viewers who come and say, hey, I installed my radiator, now I, I can't install my CPU power cables. Do I have to uninstall my radiator? Yeah, you sure do. You actually have to have these almost, I, I guarantee in almost every situation, you have to have these installed before you put your liquid cooler in. And more importantly, you really have to route them out of the way. So. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and feed these fan cables through. There's three kind of a little windows here that I can put these cables through and I'll be back to you in a second. All right, there's always a little bit of wrestling involved when you're building a PC and I just had to wrestle this into position. I really had to push it around the EPS power cables down here and then uh, also really had to route a huge mess of cables. These are now, all this stuff is coming out of the back of the case. I'll have to manage it later. But now all we're really concerned about is screwing this into place. In the case you're going to have, uh, in, in the fan and package, you're going to have a number of washers and small screws like these. Uh, very common. Most uh, liquid coolers will use something like that. You're going to put one screw through the washer and then affix it to through the top panel of the chassis. Of course, we again have 12 of these, so I'm not going to uh, bother you with how this works. Um, other than to say, make sure you line up the uh, cooler with the rails. There's actually dedicated rails, so you can see where these screws go. You'll see another line of rails here. This is for a 280 millimeter cooler. So that's a wider cooler with uh, bigger fans. That's not going to, uh, those aren't going to work here. So you have to push it all the way down so that it's at the lower rail for a 120 millimeter base cooler. And then the other slot is down here where I'll be attaching the other set of screws. Now, one thing to mention about this is that this cooler is literally as long as the top of the chassis. A lot of manufacturers will advertise that their cases can fit radiators on top, which they cannot do. Thermaltake is being very honest here. This is as big a cooler as you can fit, and you can see it's pretty tight. It's pretty tight. But there is clearance around the motherboard. It's not hitting the motherboard heatsink or the RAM. It's been a, a bit of a pet peeve of mine that a number of manufacturers have provided case samples to the Tech Buyers Guru and included in the specs a certain level of compatibility with liquid coolers, which did not exist. And so I'm on a personal vendetta uh, and a mission to make sure that ma manufacturers don't get away with that. But Thermaltake has done the right thing here. This case does fit this cooler and would fit a 280 millimeter cooler as well. All right, the next step is to mount the cooling block. To do so, you're going to need some standoffs. Two different types of standoffs are included with most coolers because uh, the Socket 2066 uses a different uh, method of attachment, but I'm using the 1151 standoffs here. They screw into four holes in the motherboard. Well, I should say in the back plate. Now remember, the back plate is actually stuck on right now with that double-sided tape. That's what allows me to attach these standoffs without having my hand behind the case. 
that is a real big benefit when, of course, the case is laying on the ground. If I had to lift up the case, hold it, hold the back plate up, and screw these in at the same time, it'd be a lot more work. So that double-sided tape does come in handy here. That's what's holding that back plate on. So I've got four of these standoffs to screw in. This just goes in by hand. You don't use a screwdriver for this. Now I've got my cooling block. Uh, I should mention there's two cables coming off of here, which is actually not that many compared to other coolers I've installed. I really appreciate that Thermaltake is keeping this to a minimum. You've got a three pin fan connector and you've got the RGB connector, which is actually also a three pin. It's the five volt three pin uh, connector. It's actually what they're using the proprietary uh, connector here, but this, uh, this just attaches to an adapter then then goes to the motherboard. Now I'm not too worried about those. I just need to keep them out of the way as I lower the cooling block down. Line it up with those standoffs. All right, we're on. Now remember, I actually had pre-applied thermal paste um, from the factory that was on here, so I didn't have to worry about it. I just placed this down on the CPU and that thermal paste will be spread out as I tighten it down. But after we do this, I'll take it back off and reapply some third-party paste from Nectua so you see what it's like. It's a different method, it's a little bit more involved. So I'm just going to attach these thumb screws. It comes with four of these. All right. Now some manufacturers actually use thumb screws that you really do just tighten with your thumbs. Thermaltake is using one that you actually tighten, you can tighten with a screwdriver, which I think is a good idea. Uh, because you do want sufficient tension on the bracket so that the cooling block is making good contact with the CPU. So as always with something like this, with any kind of cooler, you go opposite opposite screw to opposite screw, all right? And I, I go around, I'm just tightening this down halfway, I'm going around kind of corner to corner, okay? Making sure that I don't t put too much tension on one screw without any tension on the other screws. So that I have, I'm balancing the tension and, and the pressure on this cooling, on the CPU heat spreader. Okay, I'm still going around. I can feel that it's not quite tight, so I'm making sure that I even out that tension. I've got just a, a little bit ways to go, I think, before this is all the way down. All right. The cooling block is attached. Now, I do have these two cables that I have to deal with. Uh, the RGB cable, I'm going to have to figure out where I'm going to route this. It's another really long cable, mess, a mess of cable that I'm going to have to think about. Uh, the, this, this is just, this is the only power uh, cable, which I really appreciate about Thermaltake's design. Many other liquid coolers also require SATA power or USB power, um, particularly SATA power. And I find that Pretty obnoxious because you get a huge mess of cables all around the front of your motherboard. But this is going to be pretty good. We're just going to find the receptacle up here that says CPU, uh, eight, all, sorry, the all-in-one all pump. In here I've got three fan headers. They're all four pin PWM, but the pump actually is not a PWM connector, it's a three pin DC connector. I'll show that to you again. All right, that's coming off the pump. The pump actually controls its own RPMs. It doesn't really take commands from the motherboard, which is why you don't need a PWM on a, on a pump. Uh, I'm plugging that in again. A little hard to do with one hand. Okay, I got that one in. Now, like I said, there's two more headers here. One of them is labeled CPU optional, and one of them is labeled CPU fan. Typically, a lot of motherboards will throw a warning if you don't have something plugged into the CPU fan header, so that's the one you're going to want to use for the fans. Now, I have to route the cables back from the rear of the case, so I'll be back to you in a second. Here we have our 3-pin 5-volt RGB connector, 
it connects right up here to that three pin connector there it is it's very very fragile and unfortunately for whatever reason this standard was created uh, without locking pins so when you install this it doesn't actually lock into place and it can easily slide out so I'm going to uh, connect it right now here's the proprietary thermal tape cable this does not connect to a motherboard this connector actually goes into a daisy chain now um, I've actually amassed all of the cables in the back of the case they're all way back behind here we have as a matter of fact six of them because we have three thermal tape fans up here one in the rear and then two in the front they're all using the same standard which is really cool so this one controls the lighting on the pump header right here I'm going to route this to the rear of the case and attach it to that same daily chain and it will be fed RGB signals from this very same header as all the fans and all, all, all the other lighting in the system so I'm going to go ahead and do that now the cooler installation is complete let's move on to the video card installation now compared to what we've just seen installing a video card is actually quite simple you just have to remove two screws the ones that uh, line up with the PCIe slot right here and then, then there'll be back panel vents that you actually remove as well I've, I've already removed those so I'm just going to remove the screws and then insert the card depending on the size of your card some might be harder or easier to install this is again a fairly compact version of the RTX 2080 Ti it goes in just like that into the slot some cards are quite heavy and you will want to support them make sure they don't pull down on the slot too much but this one is, isn't too heavy I'm going to make sure it's all the way in the slot and then I'm going to secure it with a screw two screws in fact there we go that's the first one no problem second screw going in all right the video card is in but let's not forget the step that so many builder first time builders do forget which is to plug in the power cables and yes you do need to fill both power cable receptacles here I have that already routed from the rear of the case so I'm going to pull them through this is a split six uh, plus two pin connector I need to put those connectors together line them up for use with an eight pin receptacle all right got another one here this this being an RTX 2080 Ti a, a pretty power hungry card it does require two eight pin connectors so the good news is this system's done um, the hardest part was probably that CPU cooler people don't realize the liquid coolers are quite hard to install particularly big ones um, and this is just a mid-sized case so it was a tight fit but we got it now I'm just going to turn the case around to show you the mess of cables I have in the back now this is not some kind of lecture on proper cable management honestly I don't care that much about how these cables look at this point I can tidy these up a little bit later uh, but we had a lot of cables a lot more than your average build because of all the fans uh, associated with the liquid cooler as well as the front panel and then all the RGB cables from thermal tape so this is about as many cables as you'll see in a modern PC unless you have a bunch of hard drives and then you've got a huge mess and I don't like hard drives so luckily I don't have to deal with that I don't use hard drives but I do have my one SATA SSD over here and yes that has two cables coming out of it over there um, so this is about as good as we can get for now uh, I do want to point out one other problem I had in building this PC I actually noticed that I had a, a standards mismatch between my case and my motherboard and this is actually going to be hitting every manufacturer on the market in 2019 the motherboard has uh, ASUS has led the way in the USB 3.1 standard and all of their high-end motherboards uh, 
with the exception of their ultra high end motherboards above $300, have one USB 3.0 header and one USB 3.1 type or Gen 2 header, which I'm going to show you. So this right here is the Gen 2 header. It doesn't look anything like a USB 3.0 header, which is what I'm using down here, this very large header down here. This motherboard only has one of each, and yet the case uses an old version of Type-C that right here, this Type-C connector actually uses the USB 3.0 standard, which is not great in 2019 because it uses the same type of connector as the 3.0 ports, and yet I only have one header. All right, so what was I going to do? I bought an adapter. Now this adapter allows me to use a Gen 1 port on the front of the case with a Gen 2 header. You may also have the opposite mismatch where your case has a more advanced standard than your motherboard. For instance, a lot of motherboards, particular, particularly motherboards released in 2018, will have two Gen 1 headers and won't be able to accommodate a Gen 2 port. So we're just in a transition period, it's 2019, hopefully things will be better next year. Um, but I did have a mismatch between this new case from Thermaltake and this new motherboard from Asus. All right, the next step is actually to power this on and install an operating system. That's going to come in a different episode. But why don't I button this case up so you can see what it looks like. All right, it's done. The glass panels are on. Look very sleek. Very nice job from Thermaltake on that. Now one thing I did promise you was that I was going to show you how to apply Noctua Thermal Paste. So I'm going to do that in the extras of this video. So stay tuned if you'd like to see how that works. Otherwise you can wait until the next episode to see how to install your operating system and other software. Catch you soon. Okay, I'm going to be removing this heatsink to show you how to apply third party thermal paste. So this is what the CPU looks like after a thermal paste has been applied. You can see that actually most of the thermal paste is still on the cooler. Doesn't look like it was compressed too much. Um, while this pre-applied stuff is convenient, I don't think it's the most effective. So I'm going to take that off using Noctua's cleaning wipes. Sure enough, it looks kind of like a wipe but it's pre-soaked in alcohol, which is the best material for removing pre-applied thermal paste. You know, the, stuff, the, the thing about this pre-applied stuff from Thermaltake and really from other manufacturers is it really doesn't, it's really sticky, all right? I don't like this stuff that much. Again, it's nice that Thermaltake includes it just for convenience, but this stuff is really sticky and, and doesn't compress well and doesn't spread well. That's why we see it really didn't spread very well onto this Core i9. I'm going to remove the, the little bit of sticky residue. You can see how nicely it wipes up with these Noctua cleaning wipes. It's really kind of stuck on there. I, I don't love this stuff. Okay, again, you know, like a lot of manufacturers, uh, Thermaltake includes this just for convenience, but if you're serious about performance, you're going to want to go with something better. So we're going to go with, so we're going to go with NTH2. This thermal paste is brand new from Noctua. It's the follow-up to its famous NTH1 thermal paste. Noctua claims that this stuff will actually reduce temperatures by up to two degrees Celsius. So let's pop open the box. Now one thing I want to say is Noctua responded some, to some negative feedback it received about its packaging in the past. They used a lot of plastic, um, a lot of stuff that could go in the trash, and Noctua now actually packages everything in cardboard. You get a cardboard box, inside is cardboard, everything is recyclable. All right, actually, and what's really nice about NTH2 is, guess what it comes with? more cleaning wipes. So you actually don't have to buy this stuff separately. It looks like you get three in the box, which is enough for four applications of Noctua's paste or three applications after removing a pre-applied stuff. So
So back to our CPU, I'm going to apply hopefully just the right amount of NTH2. I go by the kind of the pea-sized amount right in the middle of the heat spreader. All right. So that might be just a tad much, but the worst thing that'll happen is it'll run over the edges. Uh, it, it's non-conductive, so you cannot cause a short circuit. But you're, it's probably a little bit better to have too much than too little. And like I said, it'll just run over the edges of the heat spreader. All right, which the worst thing about that is you'll have more to clean up when you remove the, the, the cooler uh, for maintenance or replacement. But let's go ahead and put the cooling block on top. Now I'm just going to press this down by hand so you can see what it looks like afterwards and how nicely this thermal paste spreads. You can see it's already spreading with just a little bit of pressure from my hand. Once we bolt that down, that's going to cover the whole heat spreader. That's going to be great. It's going to be perfect thermal interface. All right, I'm just going to reset my cable positions here, tuck them out of the way, and we're done. So uh, that was the process of changing thermal, thermal paste. Again, I want to thank Noctua for providing a sample of its clean wipes. And most importantly, of course, it's excellent NTH to thermal paste. Uh, you could see how nicely it applies, how nicely it spreads and covers that heat spreader for the optimal thermal interface. And like I said, next episode is going to be installing all your software, including the OS. We'll catch you next time.